My name is Stephanie White. I work with Williamsburg Counseling. Um, and I specialize, I'm a therapist and I specialize in addiction and families in crisis. Um, and so today we're gonna be talking about kind of how we are coping with COVID and mental health issues that have come arise because of COVID um, and just kind of how bibliotherapy or the use of books has really been helpful. Um, and I just wanna thank the Heritage Public Library for for having me and for letting me present. So some COVID related issues that have come up. Um, the, the main one is social isolation and just how, because the first couple of months when we were in total lockdown, it was estimated that 30% of people, especially single people that lived alone, did not have any contact with people for the first couple months. So if you can imagine you go from going to work seeing your loved ones, being able to just kind of come and go as you please, going to restaurants, and then all of a sudden you're told that you can't go anywhere, that's going to really increase other symptoms and other issues, such as depression and anxiety and suicide ideation. So a lot of these issues are stemming from that social isolation. Um, and there are some specific populations that are more at risk for these issues or they're exacerbated because of the social isolation. Um, and because that, like people that are older, the elder population, students, and the LGBTQ community, those are known, those certain populations tend to be more at risk. Um, especially if you think about older adults, a lot of them are in assisted living and they're still in lockdown. A lot of them cannot be with their families. They can talk to them on the phone or they can kind of see them through a, a glass or, I know some are able to actually go in, but they're not allowed to leave. And a lot of times, especially in assisted living, the highlight of your day is being able to go out and to go run errands and just to be out in public. So this has affected them tremendously and with their depression, especially. And along with suicide ideation, because of the depression increasing so rapidly, um, there has been a lot of suicide ideation. There's been a lot of suicide attempts I also work, um, I go into the hospitals and I evaluate people that have attempted suicide. And right now we have seen so many adolescents, um, children, teenage adult, you know, teenage age, um, where they're having to learn at home, always being taught and, um, you know, used to having that peer support, used to having to be able to socialize with their friends. And now they're not getting that. And it's such a change for them that they're not able to kind of cope with that. Um, and if you think about it, a lot of developmental uh, occurrences are because of being able to socialize. And that is a huge part of learning and of growing and they're not getting that piece. And then on top of it, they're sitting in front of a camera all day um, and they're kind of at their wits end and they don't know how to handle all these issues that are coming up for them. Um, and then as well as anxiety, a lot of people are because of not knowing what our future holds with anxiety, some um, symptoms are that you're having rapid thoughts about your future or your past. And right now it has a lot to do with your with people's future, um, how they're gonna pay rent, how are they going to support their family, um, if they're even gonna have a job tomorrow. So a lot of these issues that normally we may not see on an everyday basis, people are starting to have to kind of cope with the unknown um, and especially and in instances where they're afraid that they might get thrown out of their, their apartment. So um, anxiety has increased dramatically. And because of with, so say with the LGBTQ community, a lot of times because of their choices that they've made or their lifestyles that they have decided to live, their family is not as supportive. And so because of this, a lot of times when we are having depression and we are having anxiety or we're stressed out because because, oh my gosh, I can't pay my light bill, but I'll call my mom and she might be able to loan me the money. They don't have that type of support. So on top of already their depression and anxiety that they have, they don't have that support of being able to go to their, you know, go to their groups or go, they get a lot of support from their universities that they attend. And because of all the shutdowns and not being able to see people in person, a lot of their resources are being cut. Um, so that is, really exacerbating their issues. And we've seen a lot of um, people calling in our crisis line that are in the LGBTQ community. Um, and because of the social isolation, suicide, depression, all of that, people are trying to cope with it. 
And the way that they're coping with it, the easiest way for them is to start drinking, to start, you know, eating, all these kind of unhealthy habits that we tend to do. Substance use has gone up exponentially. Uh, this year, they say that alcohol use has gone up 250%, which is crazy to think about. Um, if, if you think about, oh, it's easy to, you know, I'm on a Zoom call today. Nobody's going to know my cup is filled with a glass of wine. It's, you know, it's lunch. I deserve a glass. One glass turns into two. After I'm done with work, I need to just kind of relax. What's the easiest way to relax? I'm going to have a drink. And so that substance use is starting to be a, a coping mechanism for people that they haven't really had before. Um, and it's numbing them. It's making them less stressed. But on the downside of that, it's causing more issues for them as well. And another at-risk population is our, um, our, when people are new in recovery. Right now, COVID has really been a struggle for them because if you're new in recovery, it is very hard to do it on your own. They always say your best thinking got you to the place where you are, which is usually in treatment, in prison, you know, at your lowest point. And now they're basically telling everybody, yes, you've been sober, you've been clean for a couple of months, but we're not doing any NA or AA groups. You know, you can't come to, you know, you can't go to lunch with your sponsor. So it's really making people feel isolated. And that's where the relapse is coming into play of I'm sitting at my house by myself, not doing anything, having plenty of time on my hands. So it's just easy for me to have a drink or to take a substance just to get my mind off of how horrible my day was. Um, so we have seen relapse has gone up quite a bit um, due to COVID. And people, like I said, nobody, everybody's over the Zoom calls. Everybody's over the Zoom you know, groups, they want to be in person and it just kind of, it makes it that much harder. So what is bibliotherapy? Um, bibliotherapy is just a fancy name for a therapeutic approach using literature to support good mental health. Um, a lot of people, we use bibliotherapy without even knowing it. What do we do when we start stressing out about something that we, we don't know about? We get more information, we start reading up on it. Um, that's why bibliotherapy is wonderful. It's cost-effective. It goes great if you are already in therapy. And a lot of times therapists will suggest that as homework in between sessions, because a lot of times people will come every other week or once a month. So while we have that in between time, I want you to read this specific book. So it is really helpful in when you're doing therapy or if you're just wanting to do it on your own. But they always recommend that you do it alongside of getting therapy as well. And one of their, there are kind of three things you want to look for in a book that would be great um, for somebody who's trying to do bibliotherapy. Because not every book is going to be beneficial to have. Um, the first thing you want to look for is if the book has a main character, you want the person who's reading it to be able to identify and connect with that main character. Because um, if you're not able to connect with that person, you know, their problems are different than mine. I don't understand them. You're not going to be able to relate. The second is that you want that individual to be able to connect to that situation and to the event that is being conveyed in the book. Um, and so with that, it also comes with, because they're able to connect, they want your emotions to start to show in that. So if you're reading a book about somebody who's had some childhood trauma and you're able to relate to that trauma, Emotions usually start to come up of, oh my gosh, I remember this. Yes, I, I went through this. And so there's that other piece and that other connection with the book that is getting a little deeper and it's not talking about something that I have no idea what it's about. And then third, it helps um, provide some insight. And so that person is now seeing their own situation and their own issues and are able to see, okay, this character went through this and they prevailed and now they're doing wonderfully. And this is my own life. This is what I've been through. This is what I have to do. And so it helps kind of just give that person some more insight and some awareness. Yeah, there are different types of books that will be beneficial for different needs. So the first book or the first type of physiotherapy is developmental. 
Developmental is usually for children, adolescents, teenagers, um, all the way, but uh, you know, as little as toddlers. And these are books that will help those individuals learn new experiences and new de de developmental stages. Um, it could be such things as going through puberty, going through divorce. Um, and a lot of times parents will give these books to children or adults will give these books to children because they feel they're not the expert. And if I'm not the expert, I don't wanna be giving information that may be wrong. Um, and so I'm just gonna let them read this book or I'm gonna read this book to them so they still get proper information, but we both know that, okay, this is what how they're supposed to be learning it. Um, a, a good example is my niece, she's about, three and she's at this stage where she wants to hit everybody. And so my mother-in-law is reading her this book and it's called like hands are made for, and it just says like hands are made for hugging, hands are made for playing. And so every time she goes to hit now, my brother-in-law will say, what are your hands for? And she can recite back the whole book. And then she kind of sits there and she thinks about it and then she puts her hands down. So it helps potty training, little things like that where it kind of clicks with kids, they're simple and they get it. Um, developmental is amazing for that. And there are so many books that could be helpful. Um, the second is therapeutic. And with therapeutic, there are three different categories. Um, perspective is a self-help type of book. Um, one of the most, I guess, popular ones this year, it's called Girl, Wash Your Face. And it's supposed to help women and just how it puts a positive spin on, yes, things are hard sometimes and we've all had hard days, but basically girl, go wash your face and let's start this day over. Um, and so it's a nice approach to how you can kind of help and like that, that being grateful book. There are just certain books that help people kind of get out of their own head. And that's the, one of the huge pieces of bibliotherapy is for people to have that. First of all, I'm not in this alone. There are other people that are going through this so much so that they made a book about it. And so it helps people kind of be more aware and have more insight. And the second category are books of prescription. And the reason why they call them books of prescription is because uh, therapists will usually prescribe them the certain book. And a lot of times these are people or clients that are coming in and showing symptoms of bipolar or depression and anxiety. And these are very beneficial because if a therapist is like, hey, I want you to start reading this book. It will help that client kind of be able to connect, start connecting the dots to where they might not have the insight before. And now they're saying, oh my gosh, I have been doing this. I did this to my family. And so they're more open to maybe having a dialogue about that certain issue um, where before they were maybe in denial about it. And then the third is creative. And these books basically are just um, it could be anywhere from a poem, a parable, a play, a novel, anything um, that kind of brings out the imagination. It could be fiction, nonfiction. So it doesn't have to be about something that's, you know, going on at this moment in the world or something specific about a disease or a, an issue. Um, and a lot of times these are great for children and both adults, but a lot of times it helps bring a deeper meaning to something that seems like it's hap like it's just a story, but a, usually there's a deeper meaning behind it. So those are the different types. And so other issues that bibliotherapy can help with, um, increasing self-awareness. I talked about this a little bit earlier, um, but I was actually reading about, there was this guy who throughout his whole life, probably from his late teens on, he was married and had children. He has been told, you're a narcissist, you're a narcissist. And of course, being a narcissist, he didn't believe it. Um, and finally, one day, he just came across this article and started reading and realized that there were some similarities. So he bought a book that had to do with narcissistic um, personality disorder, read it, and it gave him such self-awareness that he decided to go to therapy. Um, and he said that was the moment that really changed his life because he then was open to it. He was able to kind of see his patterns and was able to help because um, he was at a point where his wife was about to leave him. His children did not have a great relationship with him. And so just from starting it about reading up on it and gaining more knowledge and self-awareness, he was really able to help himself and his family. 
improving self-esteem. A lot of times, especially teenage girls, certain issues, you feel like you're the only one that are dealing with something. Um, a lot of times self-esteem that also goes into eating disorders and other types of disorders and how just being able to take something and be able to personalize it really does help that person. Like I said, a lot, especially with eating disorders, many people feel like it's not an issue for them. But if they're then reading a book and it's this person is telling their life story of how they were successful and, you know, had all these things going for them, but they were doing A, B, C, and D. And this person is saying in their head, oh, well, I do A, B, C, and D. They're able to connect the dots a little bit better. Um, grief, especially nowadays, I know that people are grieving and they're not able to maybe go to a ceremony or they're not able to kind of be together and be with their loved ones. A book about grief can be really helpful and just knowing the certain stages that they're going through, um, it makes it feel like they're not so alone. And then lastly, family related issues, family systems, Everybody has a family, even if they, you know, are estranged for them or if they're not present anymore, there's always something that's coming up. Uh, you know, it could be addiction, it could be mental health, it could just be how we, generational trauma, and how we kind of, from our grandparents, have kept maybe some things that are not healthy going in our family and just kind of helps us be able to change things around or get more insight about it as well. Some things that some populations that bibliothera bibliotherapy may not be great with are um, individuals that have intellectual disabilities, um, people that have autism or dyslexia. And just because this ends up reading ends up being more of a challenge for them than it ends up being therapeutic. But what's wonderful is that there are now audiobooks. So people with dyslexia Instead of reading it, they can be in their car and driving and listening to it. They can be, you know, in their house. So there have been great strides in helping people that may have some, or with intellectual disability, children's books. The developmental books may be a better option for them than a, a book of prescription. So it's just kind of knowing who your client is and being able to help them, with, you know, what works best for them. So we're going to do a little experiential activity. What I'm basically, I'm going to read a little parable and it's called Two Wolves. And as I'm reading it, I just want you to kind of think about what you think is the deeper meaning of this parable. And at the end, I'm just gonna have a little question. No, you don't have to answer it out loud, but just think about it for your own. So there is an old Native American tale that teaches about the young, the right versus wrong. Grandfather, can you help me with a problem I'm having? A 12-year-old boy asks one sunny morning while the two are fishing along the local river. Of course, grandson, what is it? The old wise man replies, well, I keep having this dream that there are two different wolves living inside me at the same time. One wolf is white in color and is very caring and loving. He shares his food and belongings with the others in the tribe, speaks to his elders with respect, appreciates the beauty around him, and is happy while he goes about his work for the day. Yes, grandson, I understand. I too have dreamed of the white wolf, the grandfather shares. And what about the second wolf? What is he like? Second wolf, the, grand, the grandson hesitantly replies, is not so nice. He's dark, very greedy, and angry. He steals things that he wants from the others in the tribe and speaks rudely to the elders. He cannot see the beauty around him and complains any time he has to do anything he does not feel like doing. Yes, grandson, I understand I too have dreamed of the black wolf, the grandfather replies. You know, you now know and understand the two. What is the problem you're having? It seems that both live inside me at the same time. I'm very confused some days. It's easy for the white wolf to appear in my life like today. When I'm here with you, I feel stronger now but on some days, the black wolf shows up, and he is the one that is stronger than the other. I don't think they can be present at the same time. It's like they're always fighting with each other, and only one can win. Grandfather, my question to you is, the boy continues, which of the wolves will win? After pulling ashore the fishing net, the two toss and catch the nice-sized fish in a hand-woven cedar basket. The grandfather begins. 
The first thing you should know, my grandson, is that these two wolves live inside everyone. They are the choices that life every member of the tribe must make. You are right, the wolves are always fighting with each other. Only one can win. The grandfather tosses the net back into the river, complaining about his back. Silently, the two watch the current of the river. Grandfather, the boy says excitedly, you haven't answered my question. Which of these two wolves end up winning? The grandfather turns to his grandson, looks into his eyes and answers. My son, the answer is simple. It's the wolf that you decide to feed. He will be stronger and will win. So basically, the question that usually comes up for people is, how does the black wolf appear in your life? And how does the white wolf appear in your life? Um, and so just taking a minute and figuring out what the white wolf represents for you and what the black wolf represents for you. And I think for me personally, the white wolf is usually my morality. It's my higher power. It's something that I think I strive to be. And the black wolf is usually my doubt, my selfishness. Um, and a lot of times for people, they can represent that as their addiction. Um, people see it as the devil. And as the white wolf, they see that as their higher power or um, you know, their helping and compassionate side of them. So there are many different ways to look at both the white wolf and the black wolf. But I think this is a great little story, a short story that goes very deep, but helps understand and lays it out simply. Does anybody have any input on the two wolves? It's so hard to starve one of them. <laughs> I know there are some days I love my black wolf. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, he sneaks a steak. <laughs> and so besides this, there's also on the next slide, this is just a short little, this is one page out of the book of Zen, which the book of Zen is a book of, uh, a book of perception, perspective, which helps kind of like the self-help book. Um, and this book is great because every day you can do something different. It has a quote, it has a question, or it asks the person to do a specific activity. And so on this day, it just says, the wise adapt themselves to circumstances as water molds itself into the pitcher. And the question that it asks is, in what ways have you changed shape throughout your life? So what I like about this, very simple, but it goes deep very quickly. And it gets people to have and help gain that self-awareness and that insight that maybe you're not gonna usually do throughout the day. And I feel like that's very common for people and especially with families, nobody's gonna sit down and have these in-depth discussions. It's just, how's your day? Life is going on, life is hard right now. The last thing that we're gonna think about is, let's sit down and talk about how we've, how we've changed throughout our life. So this really does help get to a different piece that you might not be used to on a daily basis. And lastly, these are just some recommended readings. I kind of divvied them up into certain categories with depression and anxiety. A great book is Healing Without Freud or Prozac, Natural Approaches to Curing Stress, Anxiety, Depression Without Drugs or Psychoanalysis, which I always recommend therapy though. But it is a, it's a great book just for learning about depression and anxiety. Great self-care one is The Gift of Imper Imperfection. Brene Brown is a well-known therapist who has an amazing following. It's just that book talks about how nobody's perfect. We're not meant to be perfect and kind of just embracing that imperfection. The Daily Journal, is, the Daily Zen Journal is great, simple. A lot of times people don't want to sit down and read a novel or they don't want to get into really heavy stuff. And the Daily Zen Journal just kind of helps little but keeps you motivated on a daily basis to keep that mindfulness and there are self-care right now mindfulness is so popular and so getting into that simple being present staying in the moment not trying to think about the future or the past that helps a lot with people's anxieties ptsd and trauma um wild a journey from lost to found or the body keeps the body keeps score brain mind and body in the healing of trauma 
And these books, a lot with the PTSD and trauma, are very helpful because a lot of times people don't even understand that they have PTSD or trauma. Um, and so when they're reading books about it and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, I have panic attacks. I'm having night terrors. I'm not being, you know, I'm, I'm living in the past. I can't, I have, I'm getting triggered all the time by these certain things. They're not, you know, they're starting to connect the dots as well and say, okay, this might be something deeper. I might have to start talking about this because it's showing up in my life that I thought was okay. But now I'm realizing that maybe there are some more things I need to talk about. And then lastly, inspiration, the man searching for meaning. And a lot of inspiration books have been turned into movies. Um, the one that always comes up to mind for me is Unbreakable. Uh, you know, the ones where the people persevere, they go through all these challenges and they end up, you know, doing great. And so all those type of books that I've turned into movies, um, Eat, Love, Pray, are great inspiration books for people. And then lastly, just some information about Williamsburg Counseling. Um, I feel like everybody is always great to have somebody to talk to. And we have multiple therapists who specialize in everything ranging from depression to marriage and family to addiction. And so there's always, there's somebody here that is very helpful and is willing to help. And so if there are any questions, just let me know. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, you're welcome. Fantastic. Yeah.